The opinions expressed in the following programs are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Hi, and welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm David Shearman. My guests today are Sue Carlton, who is the mayor of Georgian Bluffs, and Niall Lovely, who is the director of community services for Georgian Bluffs. Sue, Niall, welcome. Good to have you here today. Thank you for having us. Yep, thank you. And I should say that if we're we're doing this in the middle of a thunderstorm and a rainstorm, and and if by chance we lose power, we'll just come back and pick it up again. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome to Gray Bruce. For anyone who's watching and is new to Gray Bruce, and I know that uh, this the show is watched by by a lot of people out there. Um, hey, it's it's spring, it's Gray Bruce, and turn around and the weather's going to change. We know that. So, yes. all right. Well, let's let's start uh, with uh, with Niall. Niall, you're the director of community services, and what does that portfolio and uh, mean in Georgian Bluffs? Yeah, so it's a it's an exciting one um, because it, we're kind of paving paving a new avenue really for the township. So so the position is a new position, and and it's a coming together of several of the things that have been done at the township for for many many years. But I think it also reflects an ambition to to look to see um, are there things that the township can be responding to out in the community that um, you know perhaps we haven't had a, a time to focus on in the past. So the things that are falling under the portfolio at the minute is is parks, trails, and our, our outdoor recreation portfolio. Uh, we look after uh, the Shallow Lake Arena. My team helps look after the Shallow Lake Arena and uh, the, the use as a community centre during the summer. And then the two other community centres, former arenas, both in 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 Kilside at Derby there, um, and and up at Kemble. So we look after those facilities. Uh, the community services team helps look after all the building facilities that the township looks after. So numerous different uh, roads, operation spaces, the former landfill site, um, and and the administrative building here. So we look after facilities management. Um, and uh, and climate change falls into into the uh, community services portfolio and and looking at what the township's work is in terms of uh, a corporate climate action plan and how we respond to uh, the the climate uh, cr climate crisis that we see around us um, and uh, and then how we work with community and Gray County in furthering some of the the aspirations within the uh, the, the county wide plan and so so that that side of things falls into into my portfolio. And then, as you find with with working for a small municipality, a small township, the great good fortune is you you don't have one clear job. You end up rolling up your sleeves and getting involved in lots of different things. And so, I'm finding myself getting involved in 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 supporting some of the planning files that are getting uh, going through the township right now. Uh, getting to you know, have conversations around some of the asset management work that we're 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 hoping to do uh, here at the township. So, all kinds of exciting things. It's it's one of those things where I can say. If one day is dull, don't worry, because the next day will be something completely different. So it's it's good fun, um, getting a chance to meet lots of community members and 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 listening and hearing uh, and talking to them about things that they want to see in the community and that the township can support um, as we move forward. Well, that, that sounds like you're jack of all trades and master of many. Well, yeah, I, uh, that was that's a kind of way of putting it that perhaps my wife would uh, would refer to it. But the jack of all trades, I'll certainly handle that one. Sure, sure. Now, I always like to ask the staff people, what's your background? Um, to be a director of community services, what's what's required and, and what's your work experience? Where have you come from? Where have you worked? Yeah, so I'm, I consider myself to be incredibly fortunate to have had a, an amazing career that, that started um, on a, a sm started in a small community. Um, so I used to live and work on the Isle of Arran, just off the west coast of Scotland. Um, you catch a ferry, or you catch a train for 45 minutes out of Glasgow and a ferry for an hour out from there, and then a bus for 45 minutes from the ferry terminal. And there was a small community called Loch Ranza. Just 160 folks um, lived up there. And so I worked for five years at the start of my career, um, helping introduce um, uh, youngsters going through their, their, their high school education um, to the environment and teaching them aspects of geography and biology, geology, um, in in some amazing rural settings and participating in small community life there, which was which was excellent. I spent um, following on from that um, 
the next decade of my life, really working in various different places across the central belt and the uh, the bottom end of the highlands in Scotland. Uh, again, fortunate to work outdoors in parks and recreation, trail management, working with community um, on volunteering programs and looking to advance some of the, the outdoor recreation objectives that community had. And then, um, you know, all, uh, over a decade ago now, had the opportunity to to jump uh, jump over to Canada. My wife's job changed, and and I was able to follow her over um, over here, and and kind of kind of deliver on a, an ambition I had when I was uh, at, at college and stuff, and and wondered whether or not I'd land in in Canada. I have to admit, the Canada I imagined when I was in college was east or west, and not right in the middle. But um, Ontario has has proven to be a fantastic place to land, and. Um, I uh, worked, started working here with a conservation authority uh, down in Burlington, um, and then worked at the city of Kitchener. I know um, I followed. I followed a former colleague of mine, uh, Cynthia, when she she was at Kitchener when I started there. I spent a few years working at the city of Kitchener as a director of parks and cemeteries there, um, before becoming um, the the director of community services up here. And so. I, I think one of the things that actually lends itself well to working with a, in a community services portfolio is really just having a breadth of experience. You you need to have tasted a little bit of everything um, uh, to try and understand and be able to to listen and hear um, and respond to community uh, community needs of of municipalities. And and so I think probably one of the things that that has lent me well to this role. Is that diversity of experience and and breadth of experience, which I'm hoping to leverage um, every single day here. You know, it's interesting that you 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 mention your your background from <clears throat> from uh, the Isle of Arran in Scotland. I, I'm a great fan of some of the um, veterinary shows, including one called The Highland Vet, <laughs> which has absolutely stunning fo- um, images. The the photography is absolutely stunning of that part of Scotland, and so it's. Uh, I can appreciate some of the the parallels. Um, at the same time, uh, you're you're well aware that that Scottish settlers were, were original to uh, to Georgian Bluffs. Um, the uh, I had the privilege of speaking to the Rotary Club of Kilsyth, which is uh, where the original settlers from Kilsyth came from. And uh, pronunciation aside, they, they the the folks from from Kilsyth. We're quite interested to know that there was a a Kelsyth in Canada. Oh, <laughs> so it was it was good fun. But the, the connections between um, Scotland and and Canada are are long, long and deep as well. So. Very deep, very deep, very very far back, stretch far far back. And um, you know, I, I trace my ancestry back. I'm a Macleod. I'm a Macleod of Harris, um, and. Uh, uh, and was living near to Campbelltown, and there's a fierce rivalry that stretches back over generations between the McLeods and the uh, the Campbells. And so, so yes, there's a there's a there's a long history of of, of Scottish resettlement um, in Canada. And and whilst my accent is clearly not that broad in terms of my 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 Scottish ancestry, I was born and raised in England. But um, I, I'm I'm proud I'm proud of my my background. Well, it's it's, it's interesting. We we won't bring the old sod feuds over here. <laughs> Except that I I happen to know that that the uh, many of the churches in uh, Georgian Bluffs were old Presbyterians and old Scots Presbyterians, and I'm putting the bird in there uh, absolutely intentionally. Um, there's a whole trail I you know you can go down on that one, but uh, yeah, the, the the roots are long and deep, and uh, you're you're sim- simply um, following the trail. I guess yep. that's yeah. a good way to put it. Yeah. yeah. So um, you you keep, you've you've moved around here in Canada with a variety of work experiences. Um, you moved from large to small, or small, well, much smaller. Um, what brought you to Georgian Bluffs? Uh, the challenge, the opportunity, uh, spousal work opportunity. I mean, that's that's another big one these days. Where you, the spouse moves, you got to find another job in the local community. <laughs> Yeah, no. Um, this move was inspired by family, really. Um, you know, I, uh, my wife and I, um, have a have a small, um, I have a daughter, our, our young daughter, and and um, really wanted to provide a lifestyle for for her and for us as a family. I mean, it wasn't entirely selfless. Um, um, provide a lifestyle which which reflected some of the you know the the things and the values that 
that uh, my wife and I have held strong in our time in Scotland. And um, and water was a strong part of um, of the pull of Georgian Bluffs. Um, the opportunity to live near the water, the opportunity to interact with the environment in a way which, you know, we certainly couldn't um, uh, living that little bit further south, although it's only two hours down the road. It, it really is, as you, you you know, it pulls apart. That two hours makes an incredible yeah. difference in, in terms of in terms of environment and lifestyle. Um, and I think the other thing that pulled me was I, I was um, uh, when I worked for the Conservation Conservation Halton, I was very strongly involved in the Niagara Scarment Parks and Open Spaces system, um, and, and, and very strongly drawn to the environment of the escarpment um, and the 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 uh, the ridge that 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 reflects. And and so there was that. And then uh, you know, again, I said we didn't quite land uh, where we'd intended in, in in perhaps in our in our youth in in terms of Canada, but. Um, one of our most memorial, uh, memorable um, vacations in our very first year over here was up on the Bruce. And so um, this this corner of the world really did uh, inspire us in many ways. So this was a this was a move that was born from you know, wanting to invest in family. And then I would not be, uh, you know, it, it's not unfair to say I hanker after small community again. There was there was something that living in 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 small community, which really is very important to me that. The rolling up your sleeves and getting stuck in, you actually feel like you really make a difference. And so the opportunity to come and work in a small municipality in a wonderful corner of the world um, uh, really was a draw for us. And so so we've 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 jumped in with both feet and and really looking forward to both working in working in the area and and living in the community. It's interesting you say that because one of the things that I mean, I've been here 25, nearly 25 years, but <clears throat> the thing that drew me was rocks, trees, and water. That's yep. that's the that's the thing. It's rocks, trees, and water, and there are a lot of people who who share those values, and uh, we see it every day. And uh, it, it's kind of interesting that that you are one who is enhancing the experience of others. In that's Georgia the hope. Books. That's definitely the hope. <laughs> what is what is it, Sue, that you're able to get such talented people at Georgian Bluffs? I mean, I've we've we've talked. Uh, with a variety of, of staff over the last uh, year or so. And uh, it's, it's, you've got some, you, you seem to have a, the talent for, for, for attracting um, interesting and talented people. Well, we think we're the greatest place to live. So that just kind of covers it. But no, you're right. We're very <laughs> fortunate to have Niall with us and very happy to have him with us. So that experience helps us move forward in a lot of different areas. So. And I may have to duck out here. I see my repairman coming in. Okay. So well, I will be help back you. when I can get here. That's fine, Sue. We understand furnaces and heat have top priority. Yes. Thank you. All okay. right. I'll be back as thank soon you. as I can. Okay. All right. Um, well, Niall, it's you and me. So we we got all kinds of things. I got I got questions for you. Good because stuff. One, of the, one of the things that um the master plan. It's relatively new. It's only about three years old. Um, what does the the record the recreation and trails master plan entail? What's the give us the a thumbnail of it? Yeah, so obviously um, I inherit I inherit the plan, um, and I I I think that um, uh, my role is going to be trying to deliver on some of the the elements that are within that, and and some of that is is paved out in the plan, and some of it will require. You know some further work to refine some of the ambitions with it which are within it so you know, these these master plans i find them extremely um valuable in fact we were we were working on one uh, when i was leaving when i was uh, moving on from kitchener there um they really paved the direction that the municipality wants to walk in terms of um in this instance it's parks it's trails uh, and recreation facilities and so it, it captures what we've got, um, uh, and and it looks to see how community wants the township to manage those facilities and and leverage those facilities on a go forward basis. And so, within the plan, you know, we've we've recognised that uh, we've got a, a selection of parks. They tend to be slightly smaller, uh, and they can be quite unique in terms of municipal parks. And and some of them are really wonderful. I mean, we Sarawak Family Park down off Grey Road One there, just near the the Legacy Ridge Golf Course. 
uh, what a wonderful little beach um, uh, uh, to experience, and and uh, and, a, and a nice little park with some some great facilities that we've been able to build with with the uh, support of community members um, uh, uh, over the years. And so, uh, it really takes those parks and it it identifies their strengths and it does identify their weaknesses. Um, you know, we 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 need to focus a little bit more on some of our accessibility. Um, we need to focus a little bit more on making uh, those parks more accessible to more people more of the time. And so that's one of the things that um, we're, we're, we're hoping to work on through through implementing the, the plan. And then a, a big piece of the plan was really around um, uh, trails in the township. Trails are, you know, they cross the township from, from shore to shore, more or less, and from north to south. Um, they're managed by the township and they're managed by a wide range of other organizations um, uh, uh, across the township. And and so one of the things that the, the Wreck and Trails Master Plan really points to is the need for us as a township to, to look at that trail inventory, um, look to see how it's used and how it could be used in the future. Uh, and what our role as a township is in helping to facilitate that across this community. And so that will be a that will be a big body of work that comes from from that piece of work. And then although it's 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 not uh it's not such a big part of the plan it's it's an important part of the plan did speak to our indoor facilities and that would be Campbell Derby and and, and Shallow Lake and, and the importance that those facilities play um in the township and so that was that was the basis on which the work that was done on Campbell um was started um and and as we said to council although we're, we're we're probably pursuing a different direction now that work was still valuable because it helped inform us around some of the need there exists for indoor recreational space and so that will be a body of work over coming years that, that the township will need to do and 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 i look forward to being part of you mentioned the small parks uh, i think there are some you're right there are some absolute gems um the one my favorite is the one between big bay and oxenden that uh, looks north across Colpoise Bay, because you can stand one way and look north across Colpoise Bay and see the, the escarpment uh, on the other side. And you turn around, and there's the escarpment to the south. It's 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 a gem, but it's undeveloped. It's uh, and it doesn't need maybe not need a lot of development, but it's it just. Uh, even tidying up and a little loving little TLC, it might uh, might uh, be useful. But exactly. uh, there are part there are lots of parks like that. You speak of trails. Um, there's the rail trail that mm -hmm. comes out of Owen Sound and uh, goes across um, into Bruce County into Park Head, um, out through Copper Kettle, Ben Allen to Copper Kettle, and and through Shallow Lake. And then down through, well, actually, shallow lake. Yes, down through shallow lake. There's that one, and then the other one that that is that uh, is out there, of course, is and this is sort of like the the big one is the Bruce Trail, which yeah. is managed not by the municipality but by a separate organization. Yeah, and and the Bruce Trail. I mean, just to give a, a shout out to the Bruce Trail, I've had the opportunity to to work with with volunteers in in the Toronto and the. Uh, um, uh, uh, the Iroquois district, and I'm looking forward to connecting with more members in the Sydenham district that looks after this area. But yeah, nearly 900 kilometers long and and managed and inspired essentially by uh, by just volunteers. And 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 what an amazing amount of work is pulled in by those volunteers, both in managing the trail, but also in fundraising to secure land. The, the Bruce Trail Conservancy do way more than just manage the trail. And I say just manage the trail, but that's a feat in itself. Um, but uh, I, I think they are now probably the biggest single um, uh, conservancy agency along the Niagara Escarpment, and 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 have protected huge tracts of land along the Niagara Escarpment. And you know that's work which um, which volunteers will leave a, a legacy for for hundreds of years on the landscape. And 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 as I say, driven by community, driven by volunteering. Uh, and what a what a wonderful success story it is. And if you go back into the, the history of the Roost Trail, it, it really came out of, I won't say conflict, but the um, the competition between the need for uh, to preserve the environment and to preserve the, the escarpment and the need for gravel, because that was the tension back in the 60s. Uh, I dare say I was around back then. I remember those fights. <clears throat> My father was a... a early, early member of Bruce Trail, of the Bruce Trail Association, and we would we would walk the trail in 
and I guess it would be the Halton. No, it would be uh, uh, around Milton, yeah. Rattlesnake Point, which you are probably very familiar with. Um, that area. So, but we've got tra- the the Bruce Trail. It comes through here, Olin Sound goes goes across the be down the Beaver Valley. I mean, it it's almost in many ways it defines Gray County. I think I think it does. I mean, as I say, it's a it's a it's a huge length of trail, and 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 the other thing that you know sometimes we forget when we talk about the Bruce Trail is it's more than that end to end piece as well. It, it's the side trails, and you know there are there are multiple side trails in this in this area, and those side trails are great for a for a for a hike. You don't just need to be doing the Bruce Trail. You can you know loop loop in, do short loops and slightly longer loops, and. And quite often, and you mentioned Rattlesnake Point there, of course, quite often some of the, you know, the the, the really stellar um, viewpoints that you access, you're accessing along the Bruce Trail. If you think, oh, I, just where you were mentioning Cedar Hill Park down down at Old Boys there, Skinner's Bluff, which is up above it, the, the Bruce Trail is the trail that you'll be using um, to get to the, the the lookout points at Skinner's. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, it's almost integral to 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 the municipality that 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 if it isn't the 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 Bruce Trail it's the other trails they are um, dare I say the the less well known part of the recreational pattern in uh, in Gray, in Georgian Bluffs and uh, it's it's really quite quite interesting to see that by the way you mentioned the 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 three arenas um, the Kilsyth Arena is is kind of interesting. Is that act an active arena right now, or is it a um, is it only a community center? Yeah, so it only functions as a community center. So both the um, the, the the Derby Arena uh, and the Campbell Arena, uh, you know, they 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 were they relied on a winter, um, and um, as we're seeing today, we 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 are coming into spring with a with a with a with a whack of inches of rain in a in a day, but um uh when we got cold winters you could create ice pretty much anywhere and and unfortunately our winters over the last decade 15 years have really not provided the consistently cold temperatures they're also a little on the small side for modern day um hockey and and and, and practice so they haven't functioned as arenas like ice um for 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 some time but the arena floor gets well used um so down at derby we have um we actually have roller derby at derby um uh with uh, with the with the, uh, the the what is it is a great is it the great bruce roller derby um club i, I can't remember the the club that uses it but we have roller derby down there um, and then there's a community space upstairs from there, which is used by the Derby Pioneers and has been for years. And so, so these these are spaces which serve multiple functions. Sure, and it's the the, the these are com- they are community spaces in the very best sense of the term. Um, I I kind of chuckle at, at roller derby because I thought that had kind of disappeared. No, um, it's very active here in uh, here in Grey Bruce, and so. Yeah, it's it's good to hear that that's that's the the arena they are they are using. Mm. Hey, might make some interesting spectating if nothing else. Well, I tell you what, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if any of your listeners, uh, there may be a, 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 a lot of your listeners which are very familiar with the sport, but um, I wince when when you watch full contact roller derby. I wince. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm not sure my knees are up to it. <laughs> indeed indeed and i'm sure you might have played rugby as a as a, as a young man so uh, rugby you was know my what... sport. rugby was my sport i have to admit so w- let me ask you which is which is, which makes you cringe rugby or roller derby roller derby every time i'd much i, I would take i would take on i would take on um uh, I was a back uh, when I played played rugby, so we we tried to stay out of the action. But I would I would put myself in the front line of the scrimmage rather than play roller derby. Sure, sure. Well, where is the Re- Recreation and Trails Master Plan headed? I mean, what's the the next piece of work that you see ahead of you in that in that particular area? So I think um, I think one of the, the the big priorities is is some of the accessibility pieces, and so we're hoping to move a few of those forward this year. So we're we're working on some improvements to Sarawak uh, Family Park. We're hoping to get some uh, some connectivity down there, which will will ease access to the bay for people that might have um, mobility challenges, or or even people that are mobile but would would quite prefer to have something a little firmer under their feet. So there's some some work we want to achieve there. 
uh, and then uh, Kilsyth, um, uh, the Kilsyth growing. Um, it has that new subdivision that's sort of growing out um, in behind the community centre there. And and as part of that that growth, uh, the township was able to secure a, a small park, and so there'll be a new um, playground going in in Kilsyth uh, later on this spring. Uh, and then connecting that up to the community centre, and there's quite a height difference between the two. Um, there's another trail going in there, again, aiming for accessibility to try and make sure that you know, if somebody's coming to visit, they can park up at the community centre, get down to that play area and get back up to the parking area or back up to the community centre um, in a, in a easy in as easy a way as possible. So we've got a couple of trail projects that are on the go um, that to try and make our, our parks a little bit more um, accessible. And we've... We're hoping to leverage some provincial funding to support that and add some features to to those parks. So, um, funding dependent, we might get some some extra seating in some of those locations as well, which would be really good. Now, now that raises another question: is who pays for this? And and that's you mentioned uh, provincial funding. That that's one of the I'm sure that's one of the things that you have to keep an eye on is what granting opportunities are available. Yeah, and so um, the reality is is that that. A lot of the work that's done in in the community services sphere is highly reliant on 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 funding coming from sources beyond the township. And so, um, you know, we had that conversation around around Kemble, and and we do make use wherever we can of funding pots. And so we work with some organisations uh, who work on our behalf to try and identify funding streams that might be useful for this township, and then work with us to put in applications to to try and secure those funds. And and there's a fairly good track record at the township of being successful in in applying for funds and and finding funds to to support our work. Um, and then and then we do have core funding, uh, which is made up as part of the the municipal tax base that supports some of this work as well, because unfortunately funders usually require at least a 50 percent match contribution so so it's it's a case of using those funding bodies to really leverage the the funding that the township is able to secure through through the tax base and other resourcing um to, to maximize the the value we get for 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 residents and community members and sometimes those those grants are or or are, are philanthropic gifts from the community there may be benefactors within the community who will step up and say i will um, make a gift of X number of dollars over to help complete this project. And we've, we've seen that time and time again um, across Grey Bruce, doesn't matter whether it's the hospital or the, the hospice. Uh, Chapman House is a good example, uh, but I'm sure that's one of the funding things, funding eyes that you, you have, uh, keep, you keep track of as well. Absolutely, we don't we don't tend to to knock on doors um, for that one, um, but we benefited from 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 very generous contributions um, over the years from from a number of, of Georgian Bluffs residents and um, from everything from dedication of benches um, and and support for for those sorts of things all the way up to you know rather large investments in parks so the the landscaping work at, at um, Shallow Lake was 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 privately supported, um, uh, and and there have been others. Uh, we've had infrastructure improvements at um, at the arena that's been privately funded in the past. So yeah, we're um, if there are any uh, any generous benefactors with some some spare cash in their back pocket or around the back of the sofa that would like to uh, talk to the township, we're we're very very open to those conversations and and extremely grateful when they do come across our plates. I'm also going to say one. There's a technical issue here that people may not realize is that municipalities have the ability to to um, write a charitable tax receipt. So in that way, if someone wishes to make a donation to um, a project such as a let's use let's use um, a park as an example to assist in the development of a park, they can make that as a charitable donation, and they will get that charitable tax receipt back, which um, as people who are in the business, financial planning business tell me, can be a very useful device at a particular point in your life. So um, let's remember that, folks, that uh, there are lots of opportunities. You can support your community, doesn't matter where it is, if you want to partner with your municipality. And on that note, I know we. I see we've got Sue back, so we'll we'll we're going to come back at uh, after taking a quick break and uh, have more conversation. I'm David Shearman. This is politically speaking, and yes, we'll be right back.
This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. You're watching Rogers TV. Johnny wanted to go back home. It was a thousand kilometers away. They forced him to go to the Indian restaurant to school. More than 150,000 of us children had to go. They wanted to change us. Our Father in heaven, Our Father in heaven hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Kill the Indian and the child. It's been called cultural genocide. I survived residential school. My brother, Johnny, did not. Chani Wenjack was one of thousands of children who died due to Canada's residential school system. More than 80,000 survivors and their families still live with its legacy today. Are you the type who would keep going or stop? It's not easy to stop when you have an addiction. Legalizing cannabis won't stop addiction. It trivializes its consumption. Let's be vigilant. If you need help, visit portage.ca. Hi, and welcome back to Politically Speaking. I'm David Shearman. My guests are the mayor of Georgian Bluff, Sue Carlton, and Niall Lobley, who's director of community services. Sue, uh, Niall, welcome back. Good to have you here. Good to be here. Good to be back. Now, so, so you 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 acknowledge that you may have to step out again because yeah. you, you're, you're dealing with uh, repair people, but that's okay. This is community television. We, we work with what we got. So, and by the way, Niall did a great job while you were away. I am sure he did. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he didn't let any secrets out. No. He didn't let any secrets out. Okay. Um. I want to come back, actually, Niall, this is probably in your uh, wheelhouse, the uh, Community Carbon Footprint Challenge. I was quite intrigued by this this project. It's a climate action team um, and uh, climate action committee and council. What's that about? Well, it's, it's, uh, I'm glad you mentioned this because I give it, get, a, get to do a little plug for it. So, um uh, we're 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 working with with a number of municipalities in Grey County on a program. I, I believe it was set up in Collingwood um, initially, um, and the idea is to um, encourage residents to take a few moments out of their life and explore through the use of a very easy online tool uh, what sort of impact their their household um, and their lifestyle has in terms of in terms of um, uh, carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. And so we're encouraging residents to participate by jumping onto the website, uh, following the link through, um, answering a few simple questions about, you know, the sorts of heating you've got in your house, how old your house is, how large it is, um, how often you drive a vehicle, and those sorts of questions, just to get a quick sense of what your footprint is. And it, it really is valuable to the, the resident, the homeowner, I've done it myself in my own house, just to try and understand, you know, what, what, what sort of impact am I having in, in my lifestyle? And then what we're doing as a township is uh, for every resident that um, uh, that participates, part of a tree is planted. And so we've had 60, I think it's 66 households have participated so far uh, in Georgian Bluffs in, in um, participating in the uh, in the challenge. Uh, and I think that means that we're planting 10 trees or 11 trees so far. We'd really like to get to 100 participants by the end of the year so that we can have a, a bit of a full tree planting um, to celebrate some of the success that um, residents have. So we're encouraging residents to log on. Um, uh, you can follow the, the GB Goes Green um, logo on, on our website um, and uh, go and put in your details. Um, and and tell and find out a little bit about what your your household impact is. Sounds like a kind of a win 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 scenario because you learn more about your carbon footprint. Uh, the the municipality gets to plant trees, and those trees um, help the environment. That's the hope. The more trees we plant, the more the off the more of the impact we offset. And when you think about it, most of, well, all of Georgian Bluffs, all of the land around here was old growth forest. 
there was a there were a lot of trees um, before settlement. So we're just kind of restoring the balance. Exactly. Yeah. Well, so um, you you got a got a, got a freebie there while while Niall covered for you, but so I have a couple of questions for you too. I know that we've talked about this before, but I know that one of the big issues across Grey Bruce, particularly as we come into the summer season or the tourist season, is short-term accommodation. Where are is Georgian Bluffs at with short-term accommodation now? Well, at this point, we have put a nuisance bylaw into place, and we've given staff some direction about some reports that we'd like to see come back because we really need to know how serious an issue is this to start with. Um, and township staff and councillors at the Roma conference, this was one of the first um, seminar or sessions that we attended was on short-term accommodations. So part of it is talking to other municipalities finding out what they're doing, figuring out what would work for us, because there's no kind of one size fits all solution to any of this. And the one thing that came out of the session in January was take your time. Don't rush into this. Don't try to put something in super, super quick. Uh, be clear on how you're addressing it. Do it through uh, policy and bylaw, which can be changed not through zoning on properties, which once it's zoned a certain way, you're not gonna change that back. To have lots and lots of public consultation, find out where are the issues, what are the issues, and be very clear that when you finally put these policies and procedures in place, that they're going to fit the issues the township is currently having. So Mary and Body actually brought this up at the last county council meeting because many of us are facing the same thing right now, asking if perhaps we could all get together. Meaford's looking at it, Owen Sound, we are. I know Gray Highlands has a policy in place and so does uh, Town, of, um, Town of Blue Mountains. So are there best practices? What's worked for others? What hasn't worked? And can we get together at that level and let's all work together and see if we can come up with what will work for everybody. So that's kind of where we're at at this point is looking to get more information before we take the next steps. Um, we'd like a registration process in place, but if we don't know who's running these accommodations and there is a software package that apparently will monitor the internet to find all these rentals within each municipality. So that can then give us some information as to who to go to, to get registered, to find out where the properties are, how often are they rented out? How large a property is it? Is this for four people or 24 people? So it, there's a lot more information that has to be gathered there before we make any decision on what the final product will look like. Well, let me ask you a question about local residents. Let's say I live in Georgian Bluffs and I have a an idea from the traffic that uh, one of my neighbors is, is renting out as an air as a through Airbnb or VBRO or whatever. Um, who do they call to express their concern? Is that a bylaw issue or is it handled um, through another department? So if there's issues with the property being rented that are causing problems in a neighborhood, definitely bylaws where they're going to call. Um, and I would think that's probably the best way to start. Um, if it's only a concern, if there haven't actually been issues, maybe they want to talk to staff at the office or even counselors to bring forward to find out what the actual issue is. Mm -hmm. If it's an actual infraction they're seeing, bylaw is the way to go. If it's a concern that they're just asking about, I would suggest senior staff at the township or any of their council members. Sure. Sure, that, that makes a lot of sense because all of a sudden, yeah, I mean, this this doesn't rise to the level of, of um, I don't, don't want to use the word, but I'll use it anyway, criminality, 
mm-hmm. because it, but oh, but because it, but it may rise to the level of nuisance, yes. which is bylaw. But if there's just a simple concern, city council or municipal councilor or staff, senior staff at uh, at the uh, municipal office. That sounds like a, a a good summary of things. Is that right? Yep, I think so. Yes. Okay, and all of this will just get put into the mix so that that uh, probably six months from now, ten, eight months from now, you'll have a better idea of the patterns that you're seeing in Georgian Bluffs. Yes, and one thing that we've been asking residents to do for us, so on the Georgian Bluffs website is a button that says contact GB. So if there is an issue with a next door property being rented out, and all of that and neighbors are having problems with that we ask them to go on to the website go to contact gb enter all the information they've got what that gives us is historical data right now we don't have that historical data so we're trying to address an issue that we don't actually have anything that tells us there is an issue so If something happens on a weekend and nobody phones and lets anybody know until the following Tuesday, we can't do anything about it. But if this issue is starting on Friday night, get on to contact GB and let us know. We can get somebody out there. It will also let us know where are the hotspots? Where do we need to have bylaw enforcement somewhat patrolling and kind of watching for things, which would allow them to act faster? So we really are asking anyone with complaints in any way, shape, or form, whether it's about the short-term accommodations, whether it's an issue with roads, whatever it is, use that contact GB button because then there's an actual trail, a paper trail, so to speak, only digitally, that allows us to take a look back and say, hey, we've got issues in this area with this particular whether as I say whether it's short-term accommodations or the roads or facilities and then we can make sure that staff are acting on it and it shows staff where they need to be going where they need to be focusing so it helps everyone out and at budget time it really helps if we can take a look at that type of information and that gives us the basis for moving forward with budget items as well. Now, just to be clear, uh, for those people who are not digitally inclined or dig- have digitally um, skilled, um, they can simply pick up the phone and call the municipal office. Is that correct? They can do that. Um, this past winter, when we had our big snowstorms and it was over the holiday at Christmas, and of course, we don't have staff in the office that weekend. Um, I think all of our council members were getting phone calls about it. I any that I got, I went directly to the website and entered it for them and indicated that that's what I was doing so that staff knew. And that allowed staff to take a look at where resources were needed because they now had it was complaint driven then. Sure, sure. And that's that's pretty much the way the way of the world these days. It's it's um, if you can't be proactive, you tend to be response driven. And This is the this is the direction that uh, allows you as government to respond to the concerns as they emerge. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now n- nobody complains about community services, right, Niall? Did I mention that garbage and waste and recycling falls under community services portfolio? Oh. <laughs> So gar- so garbage and and that kind of stuff is is your your bailiwick. And if there's a problem with garbage collection, you're the guy to call. That's me. <laughs> no, you're not, Mister Garbage GB. Yeah, that's that's me. <laughs> so there's a T-shirt somewhere in there, I'm sure. But yes, there might be. Yep. <laughs> in a former it's- life, I would have printed that. <laughs> well, let, let's actually switch back to, to because waste management is a huge issue in, in every municipality. Um, what are the key issues in Georgian Bluffs in terms of waste management for, that you see, Niall? 
You know, well, I don't think we're actually unique in this. Uh, I, the there's a there's a very very strong push um, uh, from a provincial level and, and from a sort of a moral societal level, I suppose as well, um, for us to send less and less garbage to landfill, um, and 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 to make better use and reuse and recycle wherever we can of, of our garbage. And I think that's one of the one of the really big challenges of municipalities. Gone are the days where um, you know, you you basically put everything into a sack or a garbage can, and you took it to the end of your driveway and, and put it out, and somebody came and took it away, and you you could forget about it. I think residents and communities are spending more of their time um, sorting, cleaning garbage than they have in the past, and making sure it goes in the right place, so it gets picked up on the right day, uh, and really trying to lessen their impact. And so, for us as a as a township, I think. Um, Working with new provincial guidelines around recycling, we're going to be one of the first municipalities in Canada, in Ontario, sorry, um, to move to a, a different framework for um, recycling collection. The Blue Box program has been a municipal program since its inception over the last 30 years. It's becoming um, a, a, a centralized program run um, at a provincial level. Um, and so, so we're going to be the first ones to move to that new, that new model later on this year. Uh, and tra start transitioning towards ultimately a full a full um, private service um, uh, recycling service, blue box service, which will create consistency between municipalities. So that's one thing we're working on. And I think the other thing that you know we're keen to take a look at and 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 hoping to bring back some some great news to council over the next few months on this one is really looking at how we might be able to help residents manage some of their garbage, like particularly composting and and green material. Um, where there might be ways and opportunities for us as a municipality to work more proactively with residents and community members in, in how they might be able to manage um, some of their, their household green waste and, and prevent that from entering into the, the waste stream. And again, the, the whole point of this is to try and provide as much opportunity as possible to stop waste ending up in a hole in the ground. Sure. Now, now it's interesting you talk about the, the recycling program because I've heard a variety of responses from politicians about this new recycling program from uh, people throwing their hands in the air and saying, oh, my goodness, this is a total disaster uh, to your your enthusiasm. Uh, what uh, you, what does what does the, this new recycling program mean for the the individual who has a blue box today? What's going to change? So I'll first I'll start by saying I'm enthusiastic about everything. Um, even if it is a really rainy day, I'll be enthusiastic about it. It's a it's a much nicer way of being. So um, uh, not to take anything away from some of the headaches that this is cre going to create, and it certainly will. I mean, I think Georgian Bluffs is quite lucky insofar as we are very much dealing with essentially domestic refuse. We don't have very large commercial or industrial footprints. Um, we tend to have a, a large number of of more single family dwelling properties than, than perhaps others do. We don't have large condo blocks or tower blocks to handle. So our waste stream is a little easier in some respects because of that. And so this transition is not quite as scary as it might be for some municipalities. Certainly if I was doing with this in Kitchener, it would be it would have sent me grey a long time ago. Um, but yeah, I, I'm enthusiastic about it. I think for residents, what it will mean ultimately is um, uh, a more streamlined service when it comes to the blue box. Ultimately, at the minute, it's up to individual municipalities what they accept in their blue box. And that depends on the market we can send that waste to. And so if you live in Georgian Bluffs, you might be able to put some something in your blue box, whereas if you're living in Owen Sound, you might not be able to put that thing in your blue box. And that can create some real confusion with residents as to one why one municipality can provide a service and another one doesn't. So the first thing for residents is ultimately it will provide a provincial standard consistent level of service to the blue box, probably mean ultimately that more material can go into the blue box, which means more material will be able to be recycled. Um, and, and the other thing about this is because it's moving to a producer pay service, ultimately our supermarkets are paying for blue box collection now. Um, there is a financial incentive on those organizations to drive down the amount of packaging that they create. And so I, I also think that residents will find over some time of the program being in effect, that they will actually be generating less waste because there's now a financial incentive for the companies to use less packaging. Sure. Sure. It sounds like it, it, it's a more a medium to longer term 
uh, change as opposed to an instant change. But that, and there, I'm sure there will be hiccups and things. Well, maybe maybe you will have more gray hair. Well, I suspect that um, five one nine three seven six two seven two nine. Um, and Mr. Garbage Calls will probably ramp up through some of those hiccups. Sure, sure. Now, Sue, from a political perspective, do you find do you think there will be issues go, um, going forward on this new recycling uh, change because it is province-wide? So I've been following this since I first got elected eight years ago. So, and the initial documentation and reports that were coming out were really, really confusing and hard to understand. So I think it's becoming clearer. I like the idea that everyone will be under the same rules for what can be recycled. Like right now, you can't do styrofoam in Georgian Bluffs, but Hanover has a packer for it. You know, it would be nice to have that same thing across the board for everybody, just so we don't have that confusion. Do I think it'll go smoothly totally? No, I think there'll be hiccups, but eventually we'll get there. We're at least on a better track now with it. Sure, sure. Well, it's certainly an issue to be uh, to be watched, and I am absolutely certain that as we come back um, to future shows, this will be something that we'll be having conversation about. Uh, and by the way, yes, Mr. Garbage, Georgian Bluffs, <laughs> Yeah, this won't be the last time we talk about it. Okay. No, not at all. Not at all. Now, I was quite intrigued as I looked at the, um, I think it's the upcoming minutes of of the of council, where um, you're, you're, hey, anybody want to buy a snowplow? <laughs> Georgian Bluffs has two. Um, so that, that, I think, is pretty standard through all municipalities. When we purchase new equipment, the old equipment will now have, those would be the two oldest trucks. So they've been the backup in case of maintenance issues with any of the others. So at this point, bringing in a couple of new plows, we'll move two of the older ones into that backup situation. And then the oldest ones move on out. It's not that they're at the end of their life. They're still of value to someone. It's just from a municipality's perspective, we want equipment in top-notch operating conditions so that when we get dumped on like we did at Christmas and last November, we know we've got equipment that's going to go out there and handle the problem. So this is kind of standard. The county does the same thing. We'll have surplus equipment that as we've replaced with newer equipment, the surplus gets moved on out. I think that that's a very good point, Sue, because um, people may think, well, they're just going to junk it. No, no. You, you, it's, it's a form of recycling, if you want to call it that. Yep. Um, but the other thing is that the money that is recouped from the sale, if it is sold, it's presuming that it is sold, um, that comes back to the municipality. Yes, it goes back into reserves for future equipment purchases. Right. So so it it helps fund something down the road so it's it's a it's a to use my expression i used earlier it's a win 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 yes yep yeah and it's good fiscal management yes it is yeah well and as equipment gets older you're paying more in maintenance and repairs mm -hmm. on it mm -hmm. so it makes sense to upgrade to newer equipment and not continue throwing money at something that is never going to be brand new again and I think the point too is that this applies to um, most equipment, municipal equipment. I, I recall that the, um, the most the fire truck that uh, the, the brand new fire truck we just got an Owen Sound, uh, the, the old one is now somewhere down down the Huron shore working. It's still got some life in it. It's being used by a, a smaller fire department. So yep. that's that's the kind of thing that that municipalities do. Yeah, that's a fairly standard procedure for everyone. Yeah. Well, that's why we pay you the big bucks, Sue. I guess. <laughs> well, we've got about five minutes left, and I just wanted to circle back to, to Gray County. Um, now, I have I wonder what your take is on that. There was a recent decision to scale back the decision, the Rockwood Terrace um, construction. 
Sue, so what's your take on that particular issue? Was it uh, was it a good decision? You think? I think so. From my perspective, to go ahead with the full project was going to tie the county up financially for 25 years. And I don't think we as current council want to do that. So it's a good time to step back, take a look at it. What is financially feasible? We still have to do something, but let's not go for the very top of the line. We don't know what else could come at us. So you always want to have some financial resources in place or reserves, extra borrowing capability to deal with emergencies. So it just seems to be the most common sense approach for us to take at the county. Sure. I mean, it's I think it's a, it's an issue that is absolutely critical because our our um, long term care is uh, the coming wave is well the, the wave is here and uh, at some point we you we all will need these ser these services so they've got to be provided and i, I think is the aren't all uh, uh long term care homes uh, up against the time deadline as well 2025 they've got to um be in the stream for having new up to date facilities so I'm new to the long-term care committee of management at the county, but my understanding is that there are, the homes are sort of put into a grading system. So a level A is up to the specifications it needs to. Rockwood Terrace, my understanding is it was at a level C and we have until 2025 to bring it up to a higher standard. So that's what we're up against there and that's what we're attempting to do. Sure. And if I recall the warden's comments last in my last interview with him, you're going to build a new building. It's not going to be a retrofit or anything. It'll be a brand new build. Yes, it will. Yeah. yeah. And which will be of this category A type so that it's uh, it's thoroughly up to date. Yes. Now, I have to say that one of my colleagues was telling me about being in the new long term care home, which is private in owen sound and it's like night and day it's uh it's lovely but it's like it's love compared to what it was what the others were like it's yeah. like night and day so let's hope that rockwood terrace is uh just as just as good i'm sure it will be uh, and we'll look forward to the the project continuing and if you're on the long-term care committee that thank you i will be back to you to talk about it okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, it's it's always good to have these conversations. We're just about out of time. So I wanted to say to you, Sue, thank you for, for interrupting your furnace repairs to uh, to join us here. And uh, uh, Niall, thank you so much for, for getting to know you and to hearing a lot more about uh, your work um, and uh, acknowledging that uh, community services is a, is a huge part of, of Georgian Bluff's work. So thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank, and thank you, friends, for being a part of Politically Speaking. I'm David Shearman. Oh, yes, we will talk again. the Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media.
telling all journalism students. Omni Television is once again awarding scholarships to qualified students pursuing a career in third language journalism. Having this opportunity to...